Um, so I will give an introduction. This is a really large team effort. Um, and um, with this, I would like to first give you an idea of how we think about uh, genetic tools. Um, I'd say, um, what, you know, the fre people frequently use this term genetic tools, but I sort of felt like I needed to give a little bit of explanation uh, what it means and what types of genetic tools exist. So specifically for this talk, I came up with a definition that maybe we can refine in the future. Um, uh, what I would consider a genetic tool, um, it's a tool based on artificially modified genes um, that we have generated uh, in order to provide experimental access uh, to a biological entity. And that biological entity can be a cell, a cell type, uh, organelle, uh, tissue, or the whole organism. Um, then what we can do is once we have this uh, genetic tool, we can use it to visualize isolate, monitor, or perturb this biological entity. And of course, we do these things in order to understand um, uh, the properties and the function of these biological entities. To build these genetic tools, um, we really need genes. Um, so the very standard way of building genetic tools is um, based on the whole gene. Uh, what does it mean, a gene? A gene that has a particular, usually, expression. and um, an expression in a tissue or a cell type or a cell uh, that we are interested in. But um, uh, as we will uh, go into throughout the talk, you will see that we don't have to use complete genes. We can actually use just the regulatory elements, the elements in the genome that control the expression uh, of uh, that particular gene of interest. And in fact, we sometimes don't even have to know what the gene is. If we just find a regulatory element that has a particular activity, we can use it um, instead of actually knowing which gene it regulates. So uh, to give you an idea of what I mean by genes and gene, uh, gene regulatory elements, uh, I will go back to, you know, like biology 101. This is a mouse. Uh, mouse is composed of cells. Cells uh, each cell has a nucleus, and most of the cells in, in the organism have the same uh, genetic complement. Uh, in the mouse, it's 40 chromosomes, 20 times 2, uh, so uh, two of them are uh, sex chromosomes. And let's imagine, let's think about a specific gene, uh, one that is located on uh, chromosome 9. Um, this particular gene has actually been used quite a bit. Um, uh, it's called Thai one It's been used to build genetic tools. And this particular gene um, um, has the property to be expressed both in the nervous system and uh, in thymus. But the way it actually accomplishes this is it has a brain-specific enhancer that leads to a pretty wide uh, brain expression. And it also has a thymus enhancer, so a piece of DNA that, um, when bound by particular proteins, stimulates this promoter to be open and to transcribe the gene. And when this thymus enhancer is active, uh, the gene is expressed in the thymus. So one of the ways that we have used genes to build genetic tools is a so-called knock-in approach. Um, what one can do is take a uh, again, an exogenous gene, for example, a TD tomato, uh, knock it into a particular genomic mutation. So chromosome 9, Thai 1 gene at a particular place, so for example, the first axon. And what you will get is most likely um, uh, a genetic tool that will express this now exogenous gene in the pattern of the endogenous gene, Thai 1. Another approach is to actually take a portion of this gene uh, again, insert a gene, uh, exogenous gene, for example, GFP, and then one can integrate this piece of DNA randomly throughout the genome. In that particular case, there is much more variability in the type of expression you get. And in fact, that has been used to its advantage. You can get very different expression patterns depending on the location of this transgene and the copy number. And you can actually get some specificity, some differential expression, even sparseness, which has been really used uh, to, um, for example, in interrogate individual neurons in the brain. We have had uh, at the Allen Institute a really, I would say, rich um, uh, history of building genetic tools, and I really, really f feel fortunate to, um, to be able to contribute to this team. This team has been really started by Hong Kui Zeng uh, 
even before she joined <laughs> the Allen Institute because she has worked on genetic tools in her uh, prior life, prior to uh, Allen Institute. But I would say really the major start has been this paper uh, in Nature Neuroscience in 2010 where um, they build a number of reporters for Cree uh, recombinases. And one of the most used one is so-called AI-14. It actually has been distributed by JAX um, widely uh, throughout the world. Uh, the most recent numbers that we have heard from JAX is there are more than 10,000 mice distributed of this particular line alone. Um, uh, Hongkui has uh, worked to, um, together with Linda Madison, especially, to build and diversify a variety of uh, transgenic tools, and I really won't have time to go into them. Many of them have used the ROSA26 locus uh, to build not only reporters of um, recombinases, but also genes that can, or trans transgenes that can uh, perturb uh, or uh, report neural activity. Uh, we have also built a large pipeline to characterize a number of transgenic lines. This is uh, one of the papers uh, with Julie Harris leading it. And then um, we have expanded this uh, type of work to other loci that may provide advantage compared to Rosa locus to robustly and highly drive transgene expression. And this one is the one that Hong Kui in her previous work uh, discovered. It's called a tiger locus. Uh, this Paper, there was a paper in 2018 where we have um, uh, published, and I can't see from here, 26 drivers in 20, um, I can't actually see the numbers, I'm sorry, uh, 26 reporters, um, uh, many of them in Tiger, and um, trying to not only be able to uh, visualize neurons, but to perturb them in, uh, in various ways. What this talk today will focus on is building on a large amount of experience, but adding a twist um, to, um, to this approach. And, oh, all Allen mice goes to Jax, uh, and if they are not in Jax, they are with us before they go there. I just wanted to say that all of them are distributed by the Jackson lab. But the, the, um, um, the, uh, the tools that we will discuss today actually uh, use, utilize some of the transgenic lines, but on top of that, uh, actually provide a viral genetic access to specific cell types. Um, what does it mean, specific cell? Am I doing something wrong? Or? No, you're doing something great. Just okay, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so what do we mean by these next generation? Next generation is very frequently used in, this <laughs> in these talks. Next generation genetic tools. Um, we're not only trying to let's say, use viruses. Viruses have been used uh, to access uh, cell type. But we are trying to uh, define regulatory elements and define tools and define cell types in a very systematic fashion. So what does that mean? Within the last, probably, I would say, five years, uh, single cell uh, molecular analysis, single cell or genome-wide molecular analysis, transcriptomics um, and um, attack seek have really, I think, taken biology by the storm. There is a, it's become a very, almost a standard way to take, a, take cells that you're interested in, profile them transcriptomics, so using single cell transcriptome, and then define by clustering a cell type taxonomy. That means not only uh, define the cells that you may be interested in, but define the whole landscape and where the cells that you may be interested in fit. And this is just an example uh, from our uh, recent publication where we have defined uh, transcriptional cell types within uh, primary visual cortex and secondary motor cortices. And what we have discovered there is not only the types, but every single type comes with a set of genes that can be used to discover, uh, to uh, generate genetic tools. This is our friend Taiwan from the previous slide. And as you can see, it's not a very specific gene. It's a very useful gene, but it's expressed in most of the cortical neurons. But actually what uh, molecular taxonomy provides you is a number of genes that uh, can parcelate these cells at various, uh, um, at various levels. For example, we can define genes that label uh, or that are expressed in a particular class, for example, GABAergic neurons. We can define genes that are expressed in subclasses, for example, somatostatin neurons. We can define individual genes that are expressed in a single cell type. One of my favorite genes is chondrolactin chaudal. 
So if we utilize this gene that we were completely not aware was expressed in a specific cell type that it even existed, uh, I would say, in the brain, uh, we can utilize this now to build genetic tools. And with this, I will go into uh, the talk. The talk will be divided into four parts. Uh, first, Boaz Levy will talk about using single-cell RNA-seq and single-cell attack-seq to define regulatory elements to build and discover uh, new cell type-specific viral genetic tools. Then Tanya will talk about how we can use these tools together with transgenes for really refined cell type access in the mouse. Then uh, Jonathan will say how we can optimize these tools to actually provide not only mouse access, but primate access, which you can imagine using transgenes that are genomically integrated is not impossible, but very difficult. And then uh, John Mitch will talk about how we can use these genetic tools for uh, therapies. So with this, I will hand the baton to Boaz. Thank you. OK, now I can't see. So the transcriptomic taxonomy in both mouse and human has been the guiding light for the work in the human and mouse genetic tools group where we're really striving to build viral genetic tools to allow us to gain access to these cell types, to allow us to mark and manipulate these cell types. Uh, from the talks yesterday, uh, people highlighted some of the major differences, but there are clear similarities between the taxonomies of mouse mouse and human. And although I'm particularly interested in building tools that can mark and manipulate human cell types, for this part of the talk, most I'm going to describe our screening, which is mostly done in mouse tissue. So as Basilica was describing, uh, we're trying to build genetic tools uh, on an AAV backbone uh, using enhancers. Enhancers are these small cassettes of the genome that bind transcription factors that regulate gene expression. Uh, in order to do this, we had to identify the enhancer landscape at a sub, subclass resolution. And we did this by doing single cell attack seek, both on mouse and on human. We then uh, used these enhancers to uh, build viral, uh, viral tools. Uh, the way we went about this is first we would prioritize the cell type that we were interested in going after. Uh, we focused on inhibitory cells uh, primarily to this point. Uh, we find, we select enhancers and other regulatory elements, and at this point, they're putative enhancers. Uh, we use a combination of, uh, of criteria, such as sequence conservation. We want to see that a lot of these enhancers are conserved at the open chromatin level using the single cell attack seek. Uh, and then we cross-check it with other, other experimental modalities that have been published by other groups uh, that have analyzed, analyzed the uh, genomic landscape and the epigenetic landscape. Then we clone these uh, enhancers or putative enhancers upstream of a minimal promoter to drive reporter expression. And what I'm going to be telling you about uh, in this portion is we test these uh, after a systemic injection in mice first uh, to see the specificity of cell types. And we use a capsid that's uh, blood brain barrier uh, penetrant. And then Jonathan's going to talk a little bit more about how we validate these through a combination of uh, MFISH and single cell RNA seq. And then he's also going to talk about optimization of these vectors. So we've now been doing this for a couple years now. And uh, we've identified uh, enhancers that have a lot of, uh, uh, that uh, mark many different cell types, uh, that mark uh, excitatory cells generally or in a layer specific fashion. Uh, that mark inhibitory cells generally or uh, in a subclass specific fashion. And we've been uh, uh, confirming specificity using multiplex fish, as shown here, as well as single cell transcriptomics. Uh, and this is all from the mouse visual cortex, where single cells that were labeled by the virus were sorted out and uh, profiled and mapped back to the taxonomy. And we've been these single cells in, uh, uh, in cell types. Uh, where the uh, cool colors are the excitatory cells and the uh, warm colors are the uh, inhibitory cells. And so you can see that we have a variety of different specificities. And I wanted to zoom in on uh, a new collection of, en of enhancer vectors that we've developed that are built to target parvalbumin positive cells. And uh, I'm showing this heat map here, which shows enrichment at the single cell attack seek of the enhancers that we've selected. 
Uh, these are all the different enhancers. The first batch were uh, chosen before we had single cell transcriptomics. Uh, so we selected enhancers that were in the proximity of uh, known marker genes. And when we got the transcriptomic data, we could see that many of these weren't very specific. Once we had the single cell transcriptomic data, we could choose many more specific enhancers. And uh, what you can see is we were much more successful once we actually had this uh, uh, subclass resolution in the transcriptomic data. We uh, validated these by uh, uh, multiplex fish on the left and transcriptomics on the right. And now we feel like we have a, a number of new uh, parvalbumin enhancers. Uh, there's uh, an enhancer that marks both SST and PVALB cell types. It was actually predicted right here to uh, be in both of these cell types. And then we have a number of highly specific uh, vectors for parvalbumin cell types that really range from, uh, uh, from the uh, basically 94% of these cells express parvalbumin to 98%. And uh, both, uh, both uh, transcriptomics and, uh, and uh, MFISH validate this. You'll see in the orange bars, some of these are binned at, are called as uh, SST cell types, but many of these SST cell types also express parvalbumin. And one of the cool things is since we're delivering this system, these vectors systemically is we can look for parvalbumin expression or expressing cell types that are not cortical. So we are focusing on the visual cortex, but you can see parvalbumin is a, Parvalbumin is expressed in a number of different sub subcortical regions. And what we can see is these vectors have really diverse expression patterns. For instance, this vector uh, also marks Purkinje cells, which are also parvalbumin expressing cells. Uh, this particular vector doesn't label Purkinje cells, but it labels these uh, DCN uh, excitatory parvalbumin positive cell types very specifically. And our most specific vector really only labels parvalbumin inhibitory cells in the cortex. So we get an, a, range, a, a range of these different expression patterns from these AAV vectors that are really much more specific than the, our original marker gene. And we hope to uh, apply sort of a Lego logic strategy where we can use intersectional uh, techniques to label these deep brain regions very specifically. So with that, I'm going to pass it on to uh, Tanya Daigle, who's going to describe uh, how we're using these tools to uh, target cell types. Okay. Uh, thank you, Boaz. Uh, okay. So for the MOUSE project, our main goal has been to uh, develop genetic tools to target um, most cell types within primary visual cortex. And this has been a daunting task when you look at the, or it could be a daunting task given, oh, thank you, yeah. Okay, this could be a daunting task given all the cell types um, that have been uh, transcriptomically defined cell types. However, our work and the work of others in the community um, have generated a lot of transgenic lines. And so we have actually excellent coverage across many of these cell types with existing tools. However, our job has been to identify the gaps um, in coverage and to generate new genetic tools um, to act access these uh, cell types. In addition, we know that many of these cell types are um, interrelated or there's, um, at the gene expression level, there's a lot of similarities and therefore we think that it will require um, maybe more than one gene to gain access to these types. And so we've been developing our intersectional approaches in order to um, refine the genetic labeling. Uh, as Boaz um, just nicely described, so we've been taking two complementary approaches to develop these genetic tools. Um, first, by uh, leveraging the single cell attack seek data to identify these cis regulatory elements or enhancers to develop um, viral tools and then use the similar platform um, to what uh, Boaz described by delivering these viruses in retroorbital. Um, and mostly we've been focusing on delivering uh, recombinases to try to take advantage of our reporter, um, reporters that are available um, and to get whole brain expression. In addition, we've been identifying uh, candidate genes within the single cell attack seek um, to take the traditional approach of building knock-in mouse lines. Um, so to build a knock-in mouse line, we build vectors. Um, we do CRISPR-mediated targeting um, into a specific endogenous locus. Uh, we generate uh, engineered ES cells and then chimeras. 
Uh, in parallel, we've been developing tiger-based reporters. Uh, we favor this locus because it's uh, unique in that um, it gives very high uh, transgene uh, levels. Okay, so these efforts have been going on for um, quite a bit of time now to develop both driver lines as well as cell type specific enhancer viruses. And here I'm just showing you uh, two tools um, to highlight the uh, approach and um, the viral transgenic approach as well as all transgenic approach. Um, for the initial part of this work, we really focused on um, developing tools to target subcortical excitatory projection types. Um, and we selected on the left here, we wanted to disentangle these layer five excitatory types, this layer five PT um, or IT types. So we selected the CHRNA6 gene, uh, which is really exquisitely within the single cell RNA sequencing data from V1, labels just one um, layer five PT type. Additionally, we identified a putative enhancer that's uh, proximal to the FAM84B gene. The FAM84B gene is a, is a, mar is a broad marker of layer five uh, PT types. Um, for the CHRNA6, we made a driver line in which we knocked in an IRIS to FLIPO into the endogenous CHRNA6 locus after the stop codon uh, to generate um, a line. And then we are driving, we're crossing this line to AI65F, a FLIP dependent reporter, TD tomato reporter. In an all transgenic approach, you're seeing the expression here um, of native TD tomato signal. And what we see in the cortex is really beautiful uh, layer five excitatory PT type um, labeling. Um, for the, to label um, uh, multiple layer five PT types, we injected this uh, MS34 uh, FLIPO virus uh, into AI65F animals. And what you can see is that we see a much more labeling here and, um, and to, because we're able to label multiple types. Uh, we confirmed this by single cell RNA sequencing. So we harvested these TD tomato positive cells um, and looked at their expression. And we see with the, all with the all transgenic approach, we label just one layer five PT type as opposed with the viral transgenic approach, um, we label multiple PT types. So I'm showing this example in part two because um, the case of the CHRNA6 is, is really ideal, where you have a, a single tool and it gives us access to a single uh, transcriptomic cell type. However, we think that um, many, in many cases, it will be multiple tools or multiple uh, drivers or viruses that will be required to exquisitely label one type. And therefore, in parallel, we've been developing uh, reporters. Um, intersectional reporters that label that um, uh, basically report the readout of two different uh, recombinases. So here I'm showing you on the left here an example um, uh, of data from one of our newer reporters, AI 193. So this is what we consider a and or reporter. It's a dual floor for reporter that expresses. Uh, EGFP when Cree is when in the presence of Cree or flip or TD tomato in the presence of flip and it's and or because because it can express one or the other depending on the genetic uh, cell type but also you can it labels the intersecting population um, in yellow here and I'm just showing an example here of a transgenic all transgenic approach in which we crossed AI 193 to the SST iris Cree or CHRNA6 iris to flip O uh, line, and we can see mutually exclusive labeling of the SST broad uh, inhibitory cl uh, class or CHRNA6 um, layer 5 PT type. However, we see an intersecting population um, that is co-labeled. So by the single cell RNA sequencing uh, results from V1, we predicted that at this, um, the coincidence of SST, at the intersection of SST and CHRNA6, that we would label either the chattel population or the HIPSI population. And what we found by doing patch seek experiments um, targeting these dual labeled cells in motor cortex, um, and then looking at their transcriptome is that the, from the cells that we were able to um, patch and extract, um, extract cDNA from, they all map to the HIPC type and they share um, a similar electrophysiological, uh, have similar electrophysiological properties. So we were able to target um, through this intersectional cross uh, one transcriptomic cell type. 
Now, in order to study the function of, for example, HPC cells or other cells at the intersection of two genes, we need to develop new reporters with functional tools. So we've been working to build new reporters of the AND design. So here, all you're seeing is at the intersection of Cree and FLIP, um, a gene, a functional tool is expressed. For this line, AI195, it expresses GCAMP7S at the intersection of Cree and FLIP. And we're doing uh, an all, uh, a viral transgenic approach here where we've introduced um, uh, imaging, or sorry, where we've introduced viruses into AI195 to broadly label neurons. And unfortunately, this video isn't playing here. Or did it play? Uh, okay, so, <laughs> so yeah, sorry, uh, I wasn't looking at that. Uh, so, but anyway, so, you know, we see nice expression um, in uh, calcium imaging within primary visual cortex. Okay, so these are reporters for tool color. Um, what we are working towards is building reporters actually now for three colors be um, because we see a utility of labeling uh, up to three genetic cell types. So here I'm showing you our first results from our new three color uh, based reporter, AI213, where we've taken this line. So in order to label three genetic cell types with a reporter, you may need as many as six transgenes. Um, and, of course, that's not experimentally practical. Uh, quadruples is even challenging enough, let alone to do um, six. Um, so in this pr approach, we take one reporter line and we injected um, three different viruses to label three mutually exclusive types, either for pan-inhibitory, Cree, or to la label layer 5 PT or layer 5 IT. And you can see what we observed to drive expression of these three different fluorophores is a beautiful intermingling of these layer 5 types um, in different colors, and then our pan-gabaergic um, expression in EGFP. So we see um, many applications for AI213. 213 or reporters similar to this. For example, this may um, improve the throughput of our enhancer screening. Uh, right now we're doing you know, one virus, one, uh, one reporter, but this will enable us to do three viruses at one time. Or for example, we could also use this to improve um, or to look at synaptic connectivity uh, in trios versus uh, duos. So. Okay, with that, I'll introduce Jonathan, who will talk about uh, optimization of tools across species. Thank you. <clears throat> so if there's anything I've learned by watching the transgenic technology team over the years, it's that uh, making these optimized, robust, highly useful tools is really an art form. Um, it's easy to make a tool, but uh, I've made a lot of tools that don't work very well, and you know, trying to really learn from these these tricks. And uh, so we need to bring some of these generalizable strategies to bear on the development of these viral genetic tools. And as you've seen, that there's a, a really great opportunity to intersect these viral tools and the transgenic mouse lines in various ways. But in other cases, we have use cases where we want to take these tools and use them uh, in primate tissue where we don't have access to uh, a lot of driver lines or, tr or uh, genetically modified animals. So uh, in order to optimize these tools for those use cases, uh, I'm going to talk to you a little bit today about um, not so much the specific examples of enhancers that we're in the process of optimizing, but generalizable strategies that I think are exciting new opportunities. Um, and hopefully you'll get the picture of how these generalizable strategies can play out to help us access finer and finer cell types. So, you know, the optimization is very important, as mentioned, about driving high levels of functional transgenes, whether it be uh, optical imaging of activity with GCAMP or uh, doing circuit mapping with channel rhodopsin. Um, and in, in my experience, that it's even harder to get functional levels of transgene for testing in primate tissue, whether that's ex vivo or whether that's uh, in vivo. And uh, so I think this is just that the discovery of the enhancers or the regulatory elements is just one side of the coin, but I think it's been underappreciated that the optimization uh, is also equally important. And to do these optimization uh, strategies that we have a number of different platforms at our disposal. Uh, we've been using, you heard about the adult mouse with the systemic delivery of virus, uh, but we're also using slice culture platforms that allow us to move more quickly uh, and do iterative optimization. So moving from mouse testing, which is uh, faster, uh, and then using sparingly our uh, rare monkey or human tissue as it becomes available to prove out the expression strategies. 
Um, so just introducing here this paradigm for ex vivo brain slice culture uh, from primate tissue, where we can take these uh, excised uh, cubes of tissue from various brain regions and cut them into slices and put them into um, interface culture and just apply the virus directly on top. And that's a very simple way to do rapid screening. Um, and the three strategies I'm gonna tell you about, so really kind of revealing some of our trade secrets. These are not things that are well worked out, but new ideas uh, of how to innovate, how to combine uh, orthogonal approaches together to really refine specificity of labeling. And so here are three specific examples that I'll show. One about microRNA suppression uh, in specific types like excitatory neurons, intersectional labeling strategies, so building on what Tanya just showed for transgenic mouse lines, uh, and then enhancer concatamerization. So first, let's start with this microRNA suppression strategy. I think of this as a subtractive approach where you can have um, uh, microRNAs that are highly enriched in particular cell types. In this case, these two microRNAs, MIR-128 and MIR-221, are known to be two of the most highly expressed microRNAs in excitatory neurons in the brain. Um, and if you put the binding site for these microRNAs, this binding site motif, uh, next to your gene of interest in this viral vector, uh, you can uh, very robustly suppress the expression of the transgene uh, in these excitatory populations while still allowing high-level expression in inhibitory populations. And so um, to really illustrate this point, I want to take the example of a well-known, probably the best-known enhancer in the neuroscience field, this DLX enhancer, also called um, I561. This is an intergenic enhancer between DLX5 and 6. It was discovered over 20 years ago, and it was repopularized by Gord Fischel in some recent studies that they've done to show you can use that to label cortical forebrain interneuron, forebrain interneurons across five different species. One thing they described in their study that I thought was really interesting was that when you use this enhancer to drive Cree, uh, and you express that um, in an in animal uh, that has a Cree-dependent reporter, like this Cree-dependent TD tomato, you completely lose specificity. It's labeling all kinds of pyramidal cells everywhere, not just the GABAergic cells, which are marked here in, in yellow. Um, so the co-label of the green GABAergic marker with the Cree-dependent TD tomato, you see only a subset are inhibitory. Um, that was kind of buried in, in the paper, but I thought that was really interesting because this is one of the best known enhancers for labeling GABAergic cells. And what we did was applied this binding site for these microRNAs in the same vector. The vector design is identical, but for the addition of this binding site. And when we use this tool, now we can see we restore full GABAergic specificity of this vector by subtract, subtracting the labeling out of the excitatory neurons through microRNA suppression. So that's one example of cleaning up the specificity. Another idea that we had is to try to take these uh, intersectional approaches like using a split Cree, so where we can have two halves of a Cree, a Cree N and a Cree C, that then inside of the cells can recombine and reconstitute Cree activity. Um, and although this has been shown before in, in the context of transgenic animals with enhancer A and enhancer B, we're trying to move this into the viral strategy and show that we can use this effectively with viral, um, with AAV vectors. And so this is just a proof of concept showing that if you use that same DLX enhancer to drive NCRE, you get nothing. CCRE, you get maybe one glial cell there and not much expression. But when you combine these two halves together, you reconstitute the pan-gabaergic pattern here in the mouse hippocampus. Um, so uh, this is hypothetical situation at the moment, but if we take like an example of what Tanya was showing for, for her slides, uh, the similar type of scenario where you have an enhancer number one here, this is hypothetical, where this enhancer labels chandelier cells and layer five excitatory neurons, and then enhancer B labels chandelier cells and VIP inhibitory neurons. You can combine these two halves together with one driving NCRE, one driving CCRE, and hopefully get pure chandelier cell labeling. So these are the type of strategies that we're working on at the moment. Um, and, and still kind of work in progress. Um, and then lastly, we can use concatamerization of enhancers and go down and bash to the core um, region of the enhancer and build concatamers where in this case there's a 3x core of this DLX enhancer and that fragment is actually smaller than the full length uh, enhancer. Um, but when we test these vectors, uh, we see that the expression strength is incredibly much stronger, not three times stronger, but super linearly stronger than the full length enhancer. Um, and uh, immediately we thought to use this to our advantage in, um, in our pipeline where we're trying to study the properties of human interneurons. Um, and we've shown that 
although the full length enhancer, it takes maybe two weeks to three weeks to get expression to show up, we can do this over a really short term with rapid labeling in just a few days. So we get beautiful labeling like this in uh, less than a week. Uh, in fact, we can see labeled cells in human ex vivo brain slices as early as 40 hours after expression of this AAV, and we can target these cells for recording. We can also dissociate those cells and do RNA sequencing and show that they map back exclusively to the GABAergic types in the tree. Um, you'll hear more about this in a poster later this afternoon, uh, but I'll just give you kind of an uh, overview of how we're using this in our patch seek pipeline for human IVSCC, where we're, we're trying to now study the morphoelectric transcriptomic properties of human cortical interneurons using patch seek where we can uh, use the genetic label in culture to find and record from these GFP positive interneurons. Here's an example of a bunch of recordings from GFP positive interneurons mapping uh, uh, back to the, this one in particular, mapping back to the SST branch. Uh, and we can see we have EFIS mapping and morphology all from the same cell. Um, and we're doing comparisons carefully between the acute and the cultured slices and comparing the properties of these types um, and importantly, that we've been able to increase our coverage of SST types by more than fourfold using this culture and viral labeling paradigm for some unknown reason in two years of running this pipeline with acute slices, we're just not sampling SST interneurons from human. So uh, in fact, we've also sampled now four SST types not previously found in any of the acute slice experiments, showing that this is really accelerating our progress even towards characterizing rare types. So. Um, with that, I'll turn it over to John, and John will carry on this thread and talk about how we're leveraging some of these tools now to move into this exciting new space of the therapeutic potential for uh, AAV gene therapies uh, targeting interneuron types. Hi. Um, so I think you'll agree from what my colleagues have shown you today that we're having extremely exciting progress on the ability to target neurons of all types across species. And we're also interested now at the Ellen Institute and some of our most recent efforts to move these AAV-based vectors towards gene therapy applications. Uh, so as you may or may not know, uh, there's a revolution in, in treatment of brain diseases using AAV-based gene therapies that are showing promise on multiple CNS indications. These are now becoming a reality. Over the last two years, the first two treatments have been approved for AAV-based gene replacement strategies. The first, Luxturna from Spark Therapeutics, is a treatment for biallelic RPE65 mutation-associated retinal dystrophy. And this basically converts blind patients into patients that can see. Secondly, and more recently, Zolgensma from Avexis is a treatment for SMN1 mutation-associated spinal muscular atrophy, only recently approved, but in the clinical trials, uh, when they look at motor function of patients who receive this, most patients with SMA unfortunately lose motor function over time, and uh, this disease is 100% lethal in the first few years of life, but the kids who received this treatment had dramatic and re a reproducible increase in motor function, permitting them to survive with nearly 100% efficiency. So we think that there's a gigantic opportunity for AAV-based gene therapies to improve human health, and we think that our AAV-based enhancer vector system will provide for the next generation of cell-type-specific and circuit-specific gene therapy efforts. So we're trying to use our vectors for this purpose, and so far we've been focusing on Dravet syndrome. Dravet syndrome is a severe genetic childhood epilepsy. It's actually fairly common for genetic uh, diseases, and, and that's because most of the time these patients have one mutation in one allele of the large gene SCN1A, which as you may probably know is one of the main voltage-gated sodium channels in the brain. These patients who have this unfortunate disease uh, face a high mortality rate, 10 to 20% of them die in the first few years of life from severe seizures and from sudden death and epilepsy. And these patients, the ones who survive, have very limited treatment options, and they typically require constant lifelong care from various secondary symptoms from the Dravet syndrome insult. Um, and so one of the hallmark indications of Dravet syndrome is complex febrile seizures in the first year of life, shown by this purple arc, but then these lead to uh, a, a whole range of different problems for these kids. 
So uh, we've been working with our collaborator, Frank Kalume, an expert in Dravet syndrome nearby at Seattle Children's, to see if we can advance a gene therapy using our AAV system. One of the great things about developing a therapy for, a for uh, Dravet syndrome is that Dravet syndrome is one of the few brain diseases that's well modeled in mice. So uh, like I said, it's one allele loss of function, so you can take a, a a wild type over Phlox mouse and delete a single copy of SCN1A in this mouse, specifically in inhibitory neurons. And you can see that compared to wild type mice, when their body temperatures are raised, they typically don't show any seizing activity, but the single loss of function allele causes mice to dramatically get strong, complex febrile seizures at around 39 degrees. And once you raise their body temperature all the way to 41 to 42, they all are showing seizure activity. So that's similar to what's seen in humans and also similar to what's seen in humans. These mice have a high mortality rate due to this disease. And so from these data and others, we think that Dravet syndrome is predominantly a disease of inner neuron cells. And so from the data that uh, Boaz, Tanya, and Jonathan told you, we have great vectors to deliver things at high level to inhibitory neurons, whatever we want. So we wondered whether we might be able to leverage our AV vectors to treat Dravet syndrome. So working with Frank and using the optimized enhancer that Jonathan just told, told us about, um, we engineered an AAV vector to express a voltage-gated sodium channel. Here we're using a small homolog that can fit into an AAV vector with a cell-filling N-terminal tag and a protein-tagging C-terminal tag. Delivering this virus to mouse, we can see that the great majority of interneurons are expressing both the cell-filling tag and the protein tag at high levels, and that appears to be specific to interneurons here, looking at parvalumin expressing fast spiking interneurons. And looking closely at those cells, we can see that the cells appear healthy, the protein translocates throughout the cell like we would want, and also we haven't yet to observe any signs of neurotoxicity in these mice. So we're getting specific high level and safe expression of protein in inhibitory cells. So we were eager to work with Frank to deliver this to the mice that have the disease to see if there might be a recovering effect. So again, if you take controlled Dravet syndrome mice and heat up their body temperature from 37, they start to undergo uh, severe seizures by about 39 degrees of body temperature. But Dravet syndrome mice that have been delivered this vector 1500 that I just told you about actually have a substantial protection from the heat-induced seizing to almost 40 to about 41 degrees, a uh, protection of about two degrees Celsius in terms of what leads to a seizure. So we think that this, in, if translated to people, would be a, a, a real and clean, clinically meaningful benefit in the lives of these people. Um, so we're building on this, this first proof of concept data for gene replacement therapy and Dravet syndrome that we're aware of. We're pushing this harder to develop a real clinical candidate. We're exploring different therapeutic cargos, optimized enhancers, changing routes of injection, capsids, and the age of treatment for these things. And we think that this will end up with something that we can partner with industry to actually test in people to improve their lives. And so we hope that this is just the beginning of a developing cell and circuit specific gene therapy effort at the Allen Institute. With that, I would like to, uh, on behalf of the team whose talk, we'd like to thank the founder of the Ellen Institute for supporting this work and his vision, encouragement, and support. Also, everybody at the Ellen Institute, uh, mo many of which, but not all of which, are shown here for your effort to make this happen. And also, NIH for funding to Basilica, Hankui, Jonathan Boaz, and Ed. Thank you all for your time. Great talk. It's time to take some questions. I have one while we're setting up. Do you anticipate that these gene therapies, um, AAV-based gene therapies, will be like a one-shot and done situation? Or do you know yet whether it will require some maintenance and additional injections to keep? Uh, uh, yeah, that's a good question. So it's a very early, day of early days of clinical treatment for these diseases. But in the two cases that we talked about, um, the patients, it was a single injection. Um, and then uh, in the case of Luxterna, the, the kids have been followed up for over six years now, and they have a sustained clinical response to it. Cool. Okay. We have mics distributed anywhere? Any additional questions? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, <laughs> down here in front. So um, my question is how do you control for uh, viral uptake in, in, in various cell types when you're, when you're using the tools and when you're optimizing? 
for expression across different cell types. So our strategy has just been to try to deliver to as many cells as possible. So you want to infect all of the cells, ideally, and allow the regulatory elements to drive the expression in specific types. And then we showed some examples of, say, using MFISH or RNA sequencing to profile what cells had the transient expression. But the, the, be the best strategy is to try to deliver to all the cells. And the, that's one reason why we use the slice culture platform, because we're directly applying the virus, and we can get a high multiplicity of infection, and we see that we get really widespread delivery that way. Also, maybe a question um, more along the lines of uh, safety. Um, you know, obviously, AAVs have been sort of traditionally used in, in gene therapy, but are there any concerns about some of target effects or <clears throat> propensity for the virus to uh, uh, to essentially sort of live on, and is there some kind of a control level where you could, you know, lower the lower the amount of the virus by some kind of exogenous drag, and then you know bring it back up when it's needed, and so to kind of limit the amount of uh, virus that's in the cells longitudinally. Yeah, that's a great point, Tom, and this is something that we thought about. Um, so in the case of uh, Zolgensma, um, the kids, they were delivering it systemically. And actually, there's a very high viral dose. And most of the kids who got this treatment uh, actually showed liver toxicity. And so this liver toxicity actually had to be suppressed with uh, steroid treatments. So um, one of the great things about our strategy, like Jonathan told you about, is with these optimized enhancer elements, we can dial up the expression orders of magnitude, which would require, which would mean that you only have to deliver orders less magnitude of virus for the same amount of therapeutic transgene delivery. And so we think actually that this is a really powerful and generalizable plat strategy in order to really get the most bang for your buck and not have to treat large quantities of virus. So. is infected that that wouldn't normally express your therapeutic target, can the virus get actually killed in that cell? Yeah, uh, that's a, a great point. If you'd like to work with us on trying to <laughs> generate <laughs> things like that, uh, as far as I know, I haven't seen anybody do anything like that. Um, but I think it's a great idea in order to, because you know these people are going to have this in their bodies for their whole lives. And so we don't know what'll happen. You know, the best case is Luxterna that with six years out, so far it seems like it's, it's safe so far and it seems like the kids are doing okay with it. Um, but you know, what's gonna happen in 40, 50, 60 years? Over here. I, uh, I uh, often talk about issue uh, in the AAV field um, is the differential uh, tropism between rodents and primates. Um, I think that's probably happening um, mainly in vivo, but I wonder if you see that um, in vitro, you know, human slices as well, uh, human or uh, monkey slices as well. And, you know, in, 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 um, for example, um, um, control experiments. Um, and if you don't see it, um, how, are you thinking about the potential difference between uh, in vitro primate work and the future, you know, in vivo uh, application of those uh, vectors? Yeah, that's a great question. I think your thousand gene study across species really hit it, hit home on that about a lot of the key marker genes having different patterns across primate and rodent, and. Um, you know, I think that our expectation is that we would expect to find that most enhancers don't have the conserved expression pattern across species. We're intentionally trying to filter ways to find enhancers that would work across both, which would be the minority. But one of the things we've been trying to do is really collaborate closely with the Primate Center at UW and move towards where we can do some testing in vivo on our select, you know, best candidates uh, in vivo in monkey. Uh, obviously, we have limited ability to do testing on human only in ex vivo tissue, but that we hope would help to uh, clarify the picture by having in vivo to go along with the ex vivo testing in primate. Yeah, you're, you're touching upon a very important question that I was actually not uh, asking, uh, meaning the difference of enhancer sequences or in, even enhancers themselves uh, across species. Um, I was also, I think the, uh, the serotypes of the viral vectors um, could be an issue as well. That's what I was asking. 
So in addition to testing the enhancers, we also plan to, to screen uh, various capsid types in primate. So I think, uh, as was discussed a little bit earlier, that these things are, they go hand in hand. You know, there are multiple things that need to be um, optimized together, the enhancer, the capsid, uh, also the cargo. So we're, we're, we're moving in that direction, but we're not quite there yet. We're really actively building our collaborative network with our colleagues at the Primate Center. Okay, we have one more question from Edlene over here. Yeah, I have a question that gets to the sort of gene regulatory biology. I mean, I'm really struck by the result with the parvalbumin enhancers that, first of all, you can find these incredibly short enhancers that can by themselves be uh, conv conveying that sort of specificity, but also there, there are so many. And that you can deconstruct the pattern of the gene into its different components with different parts, sort of this Lego, Lego logic we've talked about. But you also looked at a number of these, and they're all functional enhancers. So this, this sort of suggests that any given gene is actually the aggregate of many enhancers acting together. Do you have an idea from your data just how many sort of on average enhancers there are likely to be contributing to a particular gene's pattern? <laughs> Not really. <laughs> I, I, one of the interesting features of the data that I showed was that I think two or three of those enhancers fall far, far, far from any gene that's specifically expressed in parvalbumin cell types. And what those particular uh, pieces of the genome are regulating endogenously, we really don't know. But we sort of set up this selection criteria to look for a high specificity in the epigenetic data. and. Uh, it seems like those seem to be good enhancers. They could be very long-range enhancers. Uh, but I think, you know, you, in the proximity of any gene, you find many peaks, but which are key for regulating that particular gene, I think require different experiments than we're doing. Okay, thanks everyone.